curse, he never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake Till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God I was born in uh, August 28, 1925. In uh, Northern Ohio, there was an airplane and two attending airplanes that came down and flew very low over the town. And I remember telling my friends that, uh, by gosh, I, I'm, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna join the Air Force. So I did. At that point, the war was getting along pretty good and they, we were going to uh, pilot training. 
So what we did basically was haul people in or haul equipment in and haul injured out or whatever. It felt pretty good being up there. Sometimes, you know, being shot at and that kind of crap, it felt pretty good to have that plane around you. Of course, we were not in on everything, and so it, a lot of the stuff was just, you know, such a surprise to us as it happened. Took off and uh, decided, well, as long as we were there, we ought to take a look at what in the hell they told us had happened with these bombs. We flew over one of the places. Boy, it uh, really shakes you up when you see something like that. I mean, God, you can't believe that people did the things or ordered the things to be done that were done. You wonder how in the hell the reasonable people can ever come to decisions like that. But it still comes back to the, why are we here? There were all kinds of things that just, somebody was looking out, you know, all the time. Whether I called it God, or if it's some other deity, or some force we don't even really know, I sure as hell was the benefit of a lot of things. I used to live across the street from Carl. We lived over there 15 years. And uh, during that time, I was kind of the guy in the neighborhood that kind of helped people out. And I, uh, every time it snowed, I was always over here with the snow blur, getting Carl's driveway first. But uh, we, uh, you know, we, we struck up a, a, a friendship that's what he's been doing. It's all of his time, helping, <laughs> helping everybody. That's what we're supposed to do. I know, but most of us don't do it. When the uh, pandemic first started, I stopped to check on him, see if he needed groceries. He, he always has lived by himself. He was okay, he was fine. But what I realized was is that for three years, nothing had been trimmed or nothing. It was really overgrown. So I asked Carl, I said, if I can get some volunteers from church, would you be okay with us coming over and helping clean up your property? And he said, well, that would, he would really appreciate that. I put it out to our DRT team that, you know, what circumstances was. And I was overwhelmed. I mean, there was 16 responses immediately. And, you know, we put a group together. It's very rewarding to see, you know, the goodness in, 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 in helping Carl. And, God, it's unbelievable. It really is unbelievable. It, it's hard to envision somebody like him putting that together and then getting all of the people to you know, do it too. And I mean, that really is, I mean, where are you gonna find that? Hello everyone, if you're listening to this, you're listening, you're watching a recording that took place early in this momentous week of election week. As of this recording, we don't know who the next president of the United States is going to be. Um, as you're hearing this recording, you still may not know. Uh, we don't know what has taken place on this week. What we do know is heaven is not wringing its hands. God is not in heaven going, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with America? depending upon the outcome or the non-outcome of this week. No, heaven is still in charge. God is still in charge. And we're in a series, today is part three, of a series called Movement, Inc. 
in which we're talking about the movement of God. That's what the church is. The church is the enterprise of God. The word church literally, ecclesia, it means task force. It means task force. It means movement inc., an organized movement to bring heaven to earth. And that's why the Bible says that in establishing his church, Jesus would go around preaching the kingdom of heaven. That's what he did. He was always talking about the enterprise of God, of bringing up there, down here, heaven to earth. And you and I are recruited to be subjects of that kingdom, servants of that enterprise through our life. And we're talking about this because this is a, is a good time of year and it's a good season in 2020 for us to just lay it down again. What does it mean to be a part of the movement of God on earth, the church? Now, this is the third parable of seven that Jesus spoke in Matthew 13. And I'm going to pick up at verse 31. We're going to actually look at two parables today. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven, the enterprise of heaven is like a mustard seed. Put your fingers together like that, like almost like barely apart, because that's how big a mustard seed is, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree. It becomes a tree about 14, 15 feet wide so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. An amazing deal. Jesus says the DNA of the kingdom is like the DNA. You look at a mustard seed and you go, oh, gee, how, that, that probably becomes a weed. No, it becomes a tree. And he says, this is what my kingdom is like. When my rule comes into any person, any entity, any team, any group, any church, it becomes something full of DNA that'll blow you away with its growth capacity. So I want you to see three lessons from this today, very quickly, very quickly, directly, three lessons from this that are so important if you're a person of the kingdom, a person of the movement of God on earth. Number one, the movement's objective is daunting. It's daunting. Jesus tells this because he knew that his followers would become discouraged. They'd become discouraged because they were a small beginning. Zechariah 4.10 says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. And that was so much why Jesus told this parable because his listeners, but especially his leaders to be, had a daunting task. That was to take the message of Christ to a world desperately in need of cleansing from sin, meaning to life, and hope in death. Of someone to love, something to do, and something to hope for. And they could be overwhelmed by that. And that's why he told them this. He says, guys, never forget, never forget that my message, my kingdom, my enterprise, my movement is like a mustard seed. And you're going you're gonna to be challenged. You see, Jesus understood that people are not motivated by ease, but by challenge. Now, if right now you're tired from COVID, you may want rest. That's not what I'm talking about. If you're tired from COVID, you may want rest, but you don't want, how many people die when they retire? Why? Because they no longer have any challenge. They think I've lived all my life to get to where I don't have to work, I don't have to produce, I don't have to do anything. And then they slowly die or they quickly die. Why? Because human nature, we were made to have dominion over the earth. We were made to accept challenges and be a part of something meaningful. And Jesus knew that, and he knew that insignificant causes rare, really do not motivate people. People respond to sacrifice more than security. People respond to challenge more than comfort. A guy by the name of Dr. Leland Stanford came to his pastor one day at his church, and he said, I, I've got some money I want to donate. And the pastor said, well, our nursery needs painted and it needs new carpet, would you mind doing that? And that, doesn't, that didn't really motivate Dr. Stanford very much. And so he went to another church, his pastor, and he said, hey, I've got some money I, I'd like to donate. And the pastor said, well, why don't, you start a, why don't you start an educational system, a college for young people to be trained and grow? And Dr. Leland Stanford did that. He bought the land that is today, Silicon Valley. He started the college that is today, Stanford University. People respond to challenge more than comfort. People like me need to remember that because I just, sometimes I, I, 
I don't, I don't want to challenge people because I know I like challenge. I need challenge. But I often don't think that other people are as crazy as I am. And the actual truth is, we are. We are. You see, the kingdom's movement is daunting. And that's okay. This is hard. If it were easy, everybody would be doing this, being a part of the movement of Jesus. But you know what? This was his life. He started out as a little tiny mustard seed of a baby in a manger. He, he, he was born in a tiny little nondescript village in Galilee. He was raised in a countryside that would be the equivalent of our Appalachia. He started with 12 apprentices, students, disciples, who most likely were cut from the varsity. Nobody wanted them on their team. And he said, you drop your nets and you follow me. You see, this is the nature of the kingdom. This is why we don't despise little things. Sometimes in our church, people say, wow, we only had six people show up to our, our regional event. We only, had, we only had 10 people at our group meeting in our community group. Don't despise small beginnings. Southbrook started in a living room. That's where we started. We started very small, but this DNA of the kingdom, the way the apostle Paul put it, he says, you have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead living in you now. And the lesson with this is this, important movements require patience. Because important things require tenacity, stick to perseverance, grit to stay with it. And I need this message so much because I know even last Sunday I walked away and went, that was, I just, my reaction emotionally was this, that was futile. That was futile. Why, why did I do that? That was futile. It feels like we're not having an effect at all. And that's exactly why Jesus spoke this parable. You've got to be patient. You've got to be willing to wait for trees to grow. A lot of times we talk about the Chinese bamboo tree. The Chinese plant the bamboo tree and they water it and they fertilize it one year, two years, three years, four years, five years. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. The Chinese bamboo tree in the fifth year in a period of six weeks grows 90 feet. And the question is, did it grow 90 feet in six weeks or did it grow 90 feet in five years? It grew 90 feet in five years because it was that watering, it was that fertilizing, it was that being patient. And this is why the Apostle Paul said, Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time. We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Look at this, look at this. Put your fingers close together again and look at this word from Jesus. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And we now know that Herod had built his own mountain near where Jesus said this. And it's very likely he was pointing to Herod's a uh, very self-indulgent mountain that he had built, man-made mountain as, a, as, an, as a, an opus to himself. And Jesus said, my kingdom will move mountains like that. My kingdom will move mountains like that. Don't you ever underestimate. Yes, your task is daunting, but your DNA is dynamic. It's dynamic. Do you believe that? Sometimes we preachers do this. We take this kind of stuff and we go, live a big life. And I've said that. I've actually said to people, you need to live a big life. Don't live a little life. Well, you know what? I don't even want to live a big life. I don't really want to live a big life. I just want to live a life. I think this whole idea of living a spectacular life is way overrated. Just live a life of faithfulness and patience and then see what God does. You are not required to live a big life to have a big impact. That's actually what Jesus is getting at in the next parable when he said the kingdom of heaven, the movement of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Now that's a piece of bread, isn't it? How did that bread rise up? Unseen yeast in the dough. He said, just just live faithful lives in your home, in your community, in your business, in your school, in your church. And over time, though nobody knows really what's going on, you, the church's presence through you, Christ's presence through you in the world will be felt and will be seen. Just trust that. The task is daunting. That's why we have to be patient. Number two, the movement's product is powerful. 
The movement's product is powerful. Again, this DNA was such that it gradually grew to this encompassing tree. And this is actually our model for leadership. Do you know that? Years ago, I read a book by Gordon McKenzie. He was an artist at Hallmark. Yes, that Hallmark, the Hallmark that now is known for Christmas movies. Do you know they made 40 of them during the COVID shutdown? I don't know how they did that, but I want to know how. Hallmark, he wrote a book called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. And he said often it's at places like Hallmark, the artists who, who are really responsible for the powerful product, they get ensnared in the hairball of organization and the pyramid structures. And he said, what has to happen, what has to happen is we got to let the, the, the producers orbit the hairball. And in that book, this was almost 30 years ago when he wrote this, it changed my view of leadership and the power of the kingdom when we see it organically. It's Movement Inc., but it's really Movement Organic. And that is that the kingdom of heaven is not a pyramid. Gordon McKenzie said pyramids are tombs for dead people. That's what they are. So it's not a pyramid structure, that the kingdom of heaven is actually an organic tree structure, and the leadership rooted into the ground and in the mission, and then the trunk, and then the limbs, and then the branches, and then the fruit. And that captured my imagination. That's why if you were to go into our Southbrook City Lights war room, you would see a drawing of a tree that has a root system of our vision and our leadership team in the ground, and then four big limbs that are our regional pastors, and then smaller limbs that are our city pastors. So from there, event planners and storytellers and prayer warriors that, that are part of the powerful organic flow of the Spirit of Christ and the kingdom of God. Our movement's product is powerful. When we get out of its way, when we get out of its way, and here's the lesson. We are always, as, as people of the kingdom, we're always planting. God is always watering and making it grow. We may be the ones who are, are through kindness and serving and words of encouragement and sharing Christ with people. We're planting, but God is the one who brings other people along to water that seed and then make it grow. This is actually what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 6. I planted, Apollos, one of his, his cohorts in ministry, his partners, I, he watered, but God made it grow. God made it grow. This is one of the great things that I have to remind myself again. I walked away last weekend, and I don't know what it was. It was an emotional weekend. It was then the Browns lost, which was even made it worse, and I was all down and everything. And then I realized, I'm not responsible for the product's results. I'm, not, I'm responsible for planting, and when God calls me watering, through kindness, through serving, to verbally sharing the kingdom. Jesus said in Mark 4, another parable, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scattered seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stock, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he takes the sickle to it because the harvest has come. He didn't know how. Farmer really didn't know how. How did that work? How did that, how did that little seed become that big harvest? I don't know. I know when I plant, and when I water and fertilize and it hits good soil, God created the dynamics that it's going to grow. It's really, really liberating. In Isaiah 55, there are these great words where God says, my word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This is so cool because all the early movement makers of the church they just went out sharing the life of Christ through their actions, through their words. And they trusted that when that hit soil that was receptive, it would not return empty. It would achieve the purpose for which I sent it, God says. And this is really encouraging. For all of us who do this serving the movement of God, it's really liberating when we know that we don't have to produce 
results on our own. God is always bringing other people alongside to water the seed we've sown. He's using us, bringing us alongside to water someone else's seed they've sown through music, through messaging, through living, through serving. And it, it makes life exciting. It makes life exciting. Because I don't know about you, I've seen God do things. There's no way, there's no way that I could have done that. But he calls us to be faithful in being movement makers, and he does the movement growing. Here's the third lesson. The movement objective is daunting. The movement's uh, product is powerful, but the movement's message is critical. It is critical. And here's the lesson on this. Jesus said in verse 32, he says, and the birds of the air will come and perch on its branches. This little seed starts out, it eventually becomes a place of rest and refuge for the birds of the air. And this is a vision of the kingdom. Remember this, in this movement, non-membership has its privileges. In this movement, what we're about is serving the world. The world doesn't exist to serve us. That's why the church has done its worst damage when it's been in power throughout history. Because then it started thinking the world was here to serve our perspectives and our convictions. In the kingdom of heaven, the enterprise of God, the movement inc. of heaven, we are here to serve the world, here's the lesson, and be a place of rest and refuge. Be a place of rest for the soul. Jesus said, come to me, all you are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my system, my teaching upon you and you'll find rest for your souls. And this is what, especially in 2020, everybody is looking for. Do I need another place where I got to go and jump through hoops to meet these religious requirements? No, most of us have tried to measure up. One of the reasons we joined church in the past is because we thought it might be a place where I finally feel like I measure up. And we realize that when we have to jump through religious hoops, that doesn't, that doesn't work. And that's why we as a church, our mission is not to connect people to religion. It is connect people to Christ. Because just as the birds of the air come and find refuge in the branches of the mustard tree, we find refuge here. I have. Church has been really hard for me. One of the reasons that I wanted to lead a church like Southbrook is that I don't really like church. I did you know, this is not something I wanted to be a part of. And that's why church, Southbrook, a lot of times, we'll just do things just to be different because sometimes just to be different. Just because we want so much for the message to connect people and connect people to Christ. You see, every person needs this. Every person needs someone to love, something to do, and something to hope for. Every human being. And in Christ, You have a transcendent idol. Your your idol is the one true God. Not an American idol, not a celebrity, not a politician, not a government leader, but you you have the king of kingdoms, the king of kings, something to do. Now your life becomes an adventure. You're like, every day you could be a part of the kingdom coming to someone because you are Jesus to that person and something to hope for. You have some hope that's transcendent of this world that no matter how much this world seems to be falling apart, there is coming a city that does not need light because the glory of God lights that city. A guy by the name of Paul Tillich said that every person has Three unsolvable dilemmas that no human being can solve on their own. There's the problem of guilt. What do we do with? We have all committed awful things. We all have. If if people knew the secrets that are listening to this right now, we would blush, wouldn't we? We all have a problem with guilt. We'd like to deny that. We change the, the label on the bottle, hoping it changes the contents. It doesn't. Euphemisms don't change poison into Pepsi. It doesn't do that. You can change the label. It doesn't change the contents. We have a problem of guilt. What do we do with that? In Christ, though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. That's amazing. The problem of meaninglessness. What's this life about? Is it, as was famously said, the meaning of life is that it ends. Really? Really? That's that's all there is to life. There's no accountability Hitler's not held to account for what he did. 
Mussolini's not held to account for what he did. There's, life has no basis for meaning. But in Christ, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority. Your life means something. You, you know where you came from. In the beginning, you made them man and woman. And you know where you're headed. If I live, you shall live also. And this life has purpose. What we do here echoes into eternity. And the third problem is the problem of death. What are we going to do with the grave? Do we all just become food for worms? And Jesus said, no, my kingdom is a kingdom that will never end. There's a proverb that says, in Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. By the time you're hearing this, I don't know what has happened. I don't know what is happening. But I do know one thing, and that is the kingdom of heaven is still in operation. Christ is still in charge. And he, he says, I want to take your little mustard seed life and you be a part of the tree of life to a world with guilt, a world that is living, trying to, to soak meaning out of the most insignificant things and a, a world that lives in the fear of death. You bring that kingdom to this world. You plant your life into this world and I'll make it grow. We're so serious about that that we have mobilized Southbrook around four regions. Each of these regions has a regional pastor. Each of those regional pastors are raising up city pastors. Those city pastors are raising up apprentices and event planners and storytellers and prayer warriors who will blanket our city with the kingdom of the heavens. And we want you now to get ready to be mobilized. And one of the ways that we're going to do that initially is to introduce you to four people who have answered the recruitment pitch to be pastors and leaders in the movement of God called Southbrook. Take a look. Sinister schemes are afoot. Our great city needs hero makers. Our city needs you. Will you be a hero maker? Will you be a hero maker?